You're on Team Human, where we challenge the operating systems driving our society, reveal the embedded codes, and share strategies for sustainable living, economic justice, and preservation of the quirky nooks and crannies that make people so much more than our algorithmically derived behavioral profiles. This is where the conscious beats the automatic, an intervention by people on behalf of people. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and I'm on Team Human, coming to you alive from Juju's Bar and Stage in London, England, the front row seats on the unraveling of the Imperialist Project. Playing for Team Human today, queen of cyberpunk, savant oracle of the near future, the first author to consider the coming interfaces between technology and the human mind, and most importantly, survivor of the U.S. medical industry, Pat Cadigan. And biologist Ted Dropout, author of The Science Delusion, The Presence of the Past, Science and Spiritual Practices, and perhaps most important of all, husband of Tibetan overtone chanter Jill Purse, my hero, Rupert Sheldrake. It's time to intervene on behalf of the people. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and you're on Team Human. So I've been getting invited a lot lately to talk about the future, which has never been something I enjoy doing, really, since the early 90s when I was asked to speak about the future of South by Southwest and realized that it was really part of that sort of Wired magazine futurism scenario planning, hire us as your consultants because the tsunami will overtake you otherwise kind of futurism. And I entitled my talk, Why Futurists Suck. And I went through Aristotle's arc, you know, beginning, middle, end, crisis, climax, completion, and as a male orgasm curve of narrative history, and <laughs> argued that this was one big coercive mess, and didn't speak about the future again until I was offered a whole lot of money to go to a resort and speak about the future to what I thought would be maybe a thousand investment bankers, given what they were paying me. And I sat in the green room, getting ready. I hadn't really seen the stage yet. And instead of bringing me out to a stage, they brought in five gentlemen, five billionaire men. Not and white men, actually. Five white male billionaires. I don't know how many black female billionaires there are. Well, I guess Oprah. Um, but certainly not in tech. And they started gently, they sort of riddled me with these questions. Should we invest in Ethereum or Bitcoin? Uh, CRISPR or 3D printing, you know, that kind of stuff that they want. The, the, the sort of people that, you know, for, for instead of thinking of, of the world in terms of a virtual future, like, like Luke does with these, with these events, it was more like an investment future, stock futures, you know, where the, the entirety of the future is this thing that you arrive at, not this thing that you make, not the Mondo 2000 early 90s cyberpunk vision of let's co-create a future together, anything we want, who, who do we want to be, how do we want to be, it's more this kind of scenario planning like future that they're used to where you go on a whiteboard and you draw a, a plus sign basically on it and you have four quadrants, you know, and one quadrant is like high, high, high wealth High tech, low wealth, high tech, low wealth, low tech, low tech, high wealth. You know, oh, and let's imagine this one, this one, this one. So it's like for Shell Oil or Exxon or someone, to, just to know about the future that we're going to arrive in so they could prepare for it. And that's the way these billionaires were thinking about the future. And once they got to what was really on their mind, the questions were more like, New Zealand or Australia or Alaska? Meaning, where should they build their underground bunker for the apocalypse, or the event, as they called it? And when finally, what the question they got to that kept us talking for the whole hour was, how do I maintain authority over my security force after the event? In other words, they've got all these hired thugs or whatever to protect them from the motorcycle gangs and the zombies or whoever's coming for them. 
from the masses. But if their money is worthless, how do they maintain control over them? So one of them was thinking, oh, we could maybe have like collars, like shock collars or something. That they, they would agree to wear them because then they get the food that's in the vault. And someone else say, oh, no, don't do that. You're going to get a, 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 just, you should be the only one who knows the combination to the vault. And I was considering telling them about history, basically, that this is the, any dictator ends up being taken over by his, his military junta, that that's just, that's how it worked. But I didn't want, I didn't go there. Instead, I tried to teach them what I call the insulation equation, which is that they're spending, they're basically trying to earn as much money as they can so they can insulate themselves from the reality they're creating by raising all that money. And that instead of doing that, what if they spent their time and energy making the world a place that they didn't feel the need to insulate themselves from? But they can't think like that because that would mean that they were actually powerful and these people don't feel powerful. They don't feel powerful enough to create the future, to influence what's happening. They only feel powerful enough to escape from what's happening, to build the rocket ship. As Jeff Bezos has already said, the, the guy who runs uh, Amazon, he couldn't think of anything better to do with all of this money than create another space program. Because he can't think about what, you know, the, the, the mass migration of people out of globally warmed uh, 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 rising sea levels or helping to, no, he can't, they can't, think that way. And I've been really trying to figure out why can't people think that way? And partly it's because of the way we engage with the digital. We engage with the digital not as a set of tools for creating a reality. We engage with the digital really as a way to get around or away from the problem of humanity. We've let our digital tools, this map, become the territory. And because human beings are not as crispy, clean, and high fidelity as our digital representations, we think that human beings are the problem and that digital technology is the solution, which is what we've been calling techno-solutionism. Now, why does that happen? How does that happen even to us? It's this thing what happens when you're in a Skype call, a Skype video call with someone else, and you're looking at them and talking, and they're agreeing with you, and you're agreeing with them, and you hang up the phone, but you don't really feel that sense of rapport, that connection. And that's because the 300,000 years of human evolution that we've developed to establish rapport, like micro nods or seeing someone's pupils dilate as they agree with you, you don't see that on Skype. And your body doesn't get that, so your mirror neurons don't flash, you don't get the oxytocin, but you don't blame the technology for that low fidelity. Instinctually, you blame the other person. Wait, they said they let, but they're not really, they don't really. And the more you blame the other person, the less you want to be with them the more you want to be with your digital simulations. Human beings are also the enemy to any digital business. Have you ever tried to run a digital business or done a pitch? And what do they say? Well, how's it going to scale? How's your company going to scale? What does scale mean? How is it going to grow with no employees? Every single employee you have is a health plan or someone's going to complain or a union or a warm body to heat. No, no, no. The only way it can scale is with no people involved. Or we succumb to that kind of West Coast Gnostic, uh, uh, let's get out of the body through digital technology. Let's just go into VR and transcend the mortal coil, the sloppy, wet, horrible, poop-filled body. Ugh. Or we strive for this, this notion of longevity, of, of, of living forever or uploading to the silicon chip. And we never think about it as a collective. It's always, I want to upload my brain to the silicon trap. How can I live forever? What is my continuity of consciousness? It individuates us. Now, what I'm trying to do and what I am imploring everyone to do is to stop thinking of the future as a noun, the future, but think of the future as a verb. The future, we can future together. I mean, really every verb is the future. Every verb, everything that you are doing right now is making the future. We are responsible for the future. This is the future. And it's something we do together and we can only do together. You can't make the future by yourself. You can escape the future by yourself or try to or think you can, but we make the future together. And that's why I'm, I'm pushing this new meme of team human. I want everyone to be on team human, to think of it as a team. You don't even need an enemy team. There's no bad team. 
Just the good team, team human. Why? Because we've got to re, we've got to re uh, acquaint ourselves with evolution. Evolution is not survival of the fittest. Even Darwin would argue it wasn't survival of the fittest. The, the cow that wandered from the herd got picked off by the lion. Evolution is a team sport. Evolution is a, is a, is a, is a collective activity. We're all part of one great nervous system. You know, digital technology, which back in the early 90s when we were playing with it, was like this new way of connecting everybody, of helping make visible the connectedness of humanity. Now it divides us. It's the opposite. It's succumbed to the winner-takes-all logic of digital capitalism. You know, where human beings only matter insofar as we have utility value. What, only, only what can be measured is some metric. If there's no metric, if there's no number for it, no value for it, it's off the map. So we end up using technology to optimize human beings for the market, rather than using technology to optimize it for people, where we know human beings are not the problem. Human beings are actually the solution. Now, even, even my great lefty greeny friends, they'll disagree with us. Oh no, human beings made a mess of this place. Guy is going to just reject us because we're so horrible. We are not horrible. We've been acting horribly, but no, human beings can actually leave a, a, an environment better than they found it. They can leave the soil more fertile. No, we are, we are conscious, which can make us nasty, but we're conscious we can also intervene. We can be stewards of nature. We can make nature less cruel rather than pretending nature is some cruel libertarian joke. No, we're conscious. So I want to talk a lot about that with Rupert later. We're conscious. What does that even mean? I mean, if, we, if, if computers someday pass the Turing test, convincing us that they're conscious, I would argue it's not because computers, computers have gotten conscious, but because we've gotten so stupid as not to be able to tell the difference. It's the same way an MP3 can fool us that it's music. It's not. The MP3 is an algorithmic trick. The MP3 is a way of convincing our brains that we're listening to music when we're not. It's like a Cheetos or something. It's like not even real food. It's like styrofoam. And that's why music loses its sacred value, right? It's not hitting our body. It's just hitting our, our earbuds as an algorithm. No, what makes human beings special is the very stuff that digital hates about us. It's the ambiguity. It's the ambivalence. What makes us human is our ability to sustain ambiguity over time, to go into wonder, to go into awe. It doesn't make sense. That's beautiful. Yet I have to argue every single day, I have to argue that humankind deserves a place in the future. I have to argue what makes us different than the zombies. I just, I just watched uh, Westworld, the, the, the spoiler of Westworld, the humans are simpler than the robots. The robots find out, oh, only a couple little algorithms is a whole person, huh? You know, that's a Ray Kurzweil's wet dream, right? Just keep a few people around to keep the lights on for the robots. And then once the robots can keep the lights on for themselves, get off the stage and surrender to our evolutionary successor. And when I argue against that, he says, oh, Doug, you just say that because you're human. <laughs> as if it's hubris. But let's take it as hubris, right? Yes, I'm on team hubris. You know, the, the out of sight, out of mind externalization of poison and poverty doesn't go away when we put on the VR goggles. It's still there, and we're contributing to it the more we do it. There is no escape. But that's not bad news, that's good news. Jump in, join us, find the others. Don't look up, look side to side. Play with Team Human. You're on Team Human, where we fold the fringes back to the center, a celebration of the weird potentials of human awareness and a spirited effort to keep it all going in the face of increasingly automated extraction, repression, surveillance, and control. It's time to design reality on our own terms. Playing for Team Human today, the author, the woman, the survivor, the legend, the nonfiction writer misidentified as a novelist for the past four decades, my hero, Pat Cadigan. Uh, 
I'm your hero. <laughs> he said I'm his hero. You are. Listen, uh, before we start, yeah. okay, the next time you're in a room with five billionaires and they want to know how can we, like, stay safe, tell them there is no escape from me, Pat <laughs> Cadigan, that I will find them and I will eat them. <laughs> Because I'm hungry. <laughs> okay, now, what do you want to talk about? Well, to start, I'm actually, if you don't take this the wrong way, but... Uh-oh. Why are you not dead yet? <laughs> it's a fair question. <laughs> it's a fair question. My oncologist... Uh, told me that I had possibly two years, possibly less. But this was in December 2014. Shit happens. <laughs> I'm not dead yet because of the National Health Service. Yes, <laughs> National Health Service! If you don't support the National Health Service, get out of here until I'm off stage. <laughs> I know, it's worked better than the U.S. medical system, yeah? Tell me about it. I still don't, I still don't understand how they have a national health system here. But they tell us it's impossible in the States, but I guess it's not. Well, it's impossible if you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like, you, it seems like your, your Twitter feed has become a, almost a, a, a middle finger to mortality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, the thing is about people, and all of you will, will, you know, will understand this, that we live our lives as if all evidence to the contrary, we are going to live forever. We're never going to die. And we continue in this way until we do die. And I don't know, maybe we don't know the difference then. But um, we, we live as if we will live forever. And uh, even, even when I got the diagnosis of doom from my oncologist, I didn't feel like I was going to die. I never felt like I was going to die. I didn't feel like I was going to die even when I was dead. That, that was a while ago. That was unrelated. You know, I was looking I came back. back. At, I was looking back at a lot of your work and thinking about how things have changed since the early 90s. And I feel like what made you so important then was your ability to really not just predict but kind of translate the future for people who were in denial about what was coming and now i feel like it perhaps the thing that's most important is your ability to retrieve the past for people who have no idea of the origins or biases of what they're using okay <laughs> i'll go with I mean, that in um, other words like you know like like your your predictions about social media well, the, the past is prologue, you know. Um, if, if, you, uh, if you ever wrote into the letter column of a newspaper, if you ever read the letter column of a newspaper, you would, you would read, you know, it's like some, some half-baked person who always writes in, writes about how everything would be okay if you just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then somebody else writes in about how we have to stop the communist threat. And then someone else writes in about how everything would be better if the damn foreigners weren't coming over to take all our jobs. Mm. I'm old enough to remember all of this, you know, it's like, it's reruns, reruns, reruns. When are we gonna get some new programming? I was thinking, I mean, I reread uh, Sinners this weekend. Sinners with a Y, like Liza with a Z. I was thinking, well, that's another old person's reference. And it could almost be, uh, when I read Sinners now, it feels like it could almost work as media literacy for people, you know, people like my daughter who don't understand uh, what these, these media do to our sense of identity and, and the way they act almost like a mirror uh, that, we, that we dress in front of. Well, um... I started uh, using chat rooms to, to talk with other science fiction writers in 1986. Mm. And, uh, and my son got interested because my son was interested in everything. He was just a little kid. 
And one of the other writers had a, a son, not quite his age, a little bit older, but they wanted to chat online because, you know, the novelty of chatting online and to another kid. So I said, that's okay. I said, but don't do that with everybody. And like, you know, mm. it's like you go out in the street, you don't tell everybody your home address and your phone number. Well, don't do that online either. Is that so hard to understand? You know, it's like, don't, you can talk to strangers, but don't tell them everything about yourself and don't give them your credit card number. And um, uh, so he, you know, he kind of got computer literate on that. I'd give him half an hour and then drag him away so that I could, I could get online and chat. But, uh, and I was, I was doing that from 1986 to when I emigrated to the UK in 1996. Hmm. And uh, so just extrapolating from that, uh, you know, to what I did with Sinners. When I wrote Sinners, I started it in 1988, and it was published in 1991. And there was a lot of science fiction in it then. And there isn't as much science fiction in it now. And I was telling someone that, and, and she said, did they suppress it? <laughs> I said, no, honey, it just caught up with me. And uh, uh, see, that's the thing. I, I remember my first novel, Mind Players, I had to make a correction in galleys because the future had caught up with me. And I had, I'd said that it was not possible to signal someone who was asleep and dreaming so that they would know that they were dreaming, so they could have a lucid dream. Well, while I was writing the book, that became possible. Mm. So I had to jump in and fix that in galleys so that I wouldn't look like a total idiot. And... Um, there are the things in centers that, that haven't come true. No one's proved that they're impossible yet. And I still think that my idea of where to put, you know, sockets, if you were going to put sockets in the, in the human skull, has some merit. I mean, I'm not a neuroscience scientist or anything. I'm not even a brain surgeon. That's probably a good thing. See that? <laughs> I cut with this hand. <laughs> but... but um, um, I, was, I wrote it because I was really interested in brains, and I was really interested in the human, the human urge to make contact with other humans. And while I was writing Sinners, I realized that there are two, two approaches to virtual reality. One approach is the person who wants to sink into it and shut the door behind them. And the other one is the one who wants to bring it out into the world. And they didn't, augmented reality hadn't been invented then. Mm. But, um, but I did the best that I could with what I had. Well, and there is no cell phones in the whole book, not one. I mean, you, you've talked in the past about your, your choice of what kind of science fiction to write, you know, and not to write these sort of super futuristic, you know, escape from the planet and colonize Mars sorts of stuff, but to look right around the corner at the near at the near future. And I suppose people say that that's what makes it cyberpunk, but to me that also makes it political. It makes it more about sort of influencing the direction that we're going or warning us about some of the directions that we're going rather than just fantasizing about something. Well, I think I had a little bit of an advantage there because I grew up uh, in Massachusetts. It's, so I, when I came over here, I knew how to pronounce Worcester and Lester. <laughs> But I spent most of my adult life in the Kansas City area, which is why I sound like this. And uh, um, I grew up below the poverty line. And uh, the whole world was making plans. And, uh, and I was in the, uh, the subculture that wasn't included. And uh, um, my mother, I never, I never went to bed hungry, but my mother did. Mm. And... Uh, um, a view of society from underneath is very uh, revealing because people will treat you like you're not there the way they will treat servants or slaves or anyone else who doesn't count. And, uh, and I made it my business like from about the time I was five that uh, I was going to count and I was going to make sure that everybody knew that everybody counted. You know, there is no one who should be 
overlooked, neglected, or left behind. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a great uh, philanthropist because I have nothing to philanthrop with. And uh, I had uh, dyslexia and dyscalculia, so that, that, that spoiled my career as a theoretical physicist completely. Um, but, um, but, you know, because you can, you can kind of figure out words from the context, but you can't do that with numbers. And I had a terrible time trying to explain to my teachers why that 38 was an 83 when I started out. Mm. So, you know, it's like, there were, there, I had some problems, but it didn't mean that I couldn't educate myself. And so I spent a lot of time in the public library. And the public library is where you can go um, if you are a very geeky person and no one is allowed to beat you up in there. <laughs> and uh, so I spent a lot of time in the public library uh, hiding out from bullies. And, uh, and I read a lot of science and I discovered that, uh, you know, I could remember it and I could remember it well enough to write science fiction, which I thought was the pinnacle of literature, the thought experiment, you know. And it didn't have to be just one kind of science fiction. You could, and well, see, when I was growing up, everything was a lot less stratified. The Lord of the Rings was science fiction. Mm. Gorman Gast was science fiction. Everything was on the science fiction shelf. So, um, so Dune was as much science fiction as, as you know, the, the Return of the King. And uh, uh, so I got quite an education in science fiction, and I wanted to know about the science behind it, so I did an awful lot of reading. And uh, uh, our best friend, uh, all us girls, who, who struggled with science in high school, our best friend was Isaac Asimov, because mm. reading one of his science books was like listening to a lecture by a really good teacher, because he'd actually say things in the book like, okay, if you didn't ex understand that, let me explain it this way. And you'd understand it. He kept me from flunking biology, he kept me from flunking chemistry, mm -hmm. and, um, and well, he didn't keep me from flunking physics, but um, I didn't flunk physics. By th by then, I was you know I was too good, but I was the only girl in my physics class. Well, this was 1969, 1970, and they didn't want me there because they wanted to say and stuff. And but I stayed. I stayed, and uh, and I was the worst student in the class. Wasn't the best, and the teacher was a draft dodger who actually wanted to major in current events but he'd switch to physics because he wouldn't send him to Vietnam if he did. It was a terrible time, yeah. and yet a wonderful time. <laughs> it was a weird time. And, uh, um, and what I discovered was that if you want education, you have to do it yourself. And if you want someone to fight for you, you have to do it yourself. And I went to University of Massachusetts, and then later the University of Kansas, on a full scholarship. And this was unheard of for a woman in 1970. The only people who got full scholarships to college at that time were the quarterbacks on the football teams. And, uh, and I did it, and I wasn't even a class valedictorian. And, uh, um, and I, that has always been my thing, is, is I've told people, find out, learn, ask, go to the source, look things up. You know, it's like the information. Information is not knowledge. Information will give you knowledge, you know. Information is a way to learn so that you can get knowledge. And, uh, and I've, I've always encouraged people to get knowledge, whatever kind of knowledge that they're most interested in. And, uh, and well, it, it got me some book contracts. <laughs> I want to go back to two things. First, this, this, the idea of the, the, basically the repressed and the poor not being heard. And as, as I've been looking at technology lately, not just science, but now technology, it seems that technology has been used almost since the beginning not to, uh, to, to 
make those voices even less heard. You know, I think of uh, Thomas Jefferson's Dumbwaiter, which we like to say, oh, wasn't that nice? He made it so the slaves wouldn't have to walk up all those stairs with the meal. No, it was so that you wouldn't see the slaves huffing and puffing. It just came automatically as if... Uh, uh, well, it actually said they could get up the stairs faster. The food. When they, they weren't carrying all that food, they could get up there faster and the food could get up there faster. And, you know, let's face it, why aren't iPads free? You know, I, I want people to ask this. Why aren't iPads free? When my mother, uh, in my mother's last year, she came with us to the UK. And she came here in 1970, uh, in, yeah, in ni 1996. And she died in 2012, at 92. And uh, God bless yeah. National Health Service. Yes! <laughs> Shout out to National Health again. Um, and Which sounds like science fiction to me yeah, as an well, American. National I know, health. I know. How is that? There's I know. I'm a recovering American myself, yeah. so. Um, we have insurance and I can't afford medicine. Yeah. My mother had given me my love of reading because she read to me from, the, from before I was even really aware that she was reading when I was an infant in arms. And, uh, and she began to lose her eyesight due to age-related macular degeneration. And when people were talking about, uh, when websites were really novel and they were talking about all the things that you could do with type and you could do, make the dance around and everything, I was thinking of all the dyslexic kids and diabetics with macular degeneration. I had a friend who was a diabetic. In fact, my friend, my friend Lisa, who's a diabetic, still is, uh, her diabetic pump was the model for Sam's wearable computer in, um, in centers. And um, she told me that what print looked like to her was it kind of went up and down and, you know, changed colors sometimes. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, these are great websites. So you get this dyslexic kid, and uh, he gets on the website, and the, and, the, and the words start changing colors and dancing around. You know? And it seemed to me that the whole, the whole tech thing was aimed at people who could afford it and were comfortable and could use it. There wasn't a whole lot of concern over accessibility. There wasn't a whole lot of concern over how much the things cost. And I, I gave my mother my iPad and I showed her how she could, you know, make the text larger, you know, just with a gesture, you know, or shrink it down and, and what you could do. And unfortunately, she, she was kind of afraid of it at that point, but um, she had a lot of other problems by then. But if she'd had that 10 years earlier, you know, and it's not, it's not anyone's fault that, you know, iPads weren't available before 2010. If she'd had that earlier, she would have gotten into it you know, and she would have grown accustomed to it. And um, I don't have my iPad with me, which is unusual because normally people think I'd have to be surgically detached from <laughs> it. But it is so intuitive and easy to use that it's, it's perfect for people. You just fool around with it and then you figure out how to use it. It's perfect for people who want to want to use it for, to access, you know, learning, access information, access the news, access cat videos. I mean, let's face it, you know, without cat videos, the terrorists win. But I'm, I'm interested that in, in, not to give away the secrets of the trade, but your, your kind of, your speculative process, you know, when you're looking at, uh, it's not future casting, but when you're looking at something in the near future, at, at about writing about that, are, are you kind of looking at existing technology and their biases and then kind of thinking, well, if we keep moving that way, it's going to be like this? Or are you looking at sort of human beings and their desires and thinking what kinds of things would they make to fulfill them? I mean, sort of what, what road is, are you following? Well, actually, since you ask, I'm looking at it like your mother. And your mother is saying, that's going to bite you in the ass. Mm. And, you know, it's like that's, that's pretty much it. You know, I'm looking at 
all the things that could go right and all the things that could go wrong. And I'm afraid uh, Murphy's Law usually rules. I'm interested, you know, I want to I play a, a clip from uh, your visit on to Virtual Futures back in uh, 1994. Where you were, Brace yourselves. Well, you were talking about I identity and in, in a way that I only kind of arrived at in 2013. So let's take a look at this. Yeah, in Fools, my novel, which was most recently published here, I realized that I had made VR inextricably intertwined with identity, a sense of self. And if you think about it, are you different in different places? Is the you who goes to the bank different from the, from the you that goes to the party? And if it isn't, how's your credit rating? A decent question, I think. No, it yeah, is. I mean, and I, you know, in, in 2013, finally, in Present Shock, I wrote about something I called digifrenia, you know, trademark. Mm -hmm. um, which the, the idea that the problem with digital technology is not information overload, but the fact that there's multiple instances of me existing simultaneously. There's my Twitter self, my Facebook self, my this self, my that. Um, and Welcome you already, to my world, honey. But you were already there, and you were, and you were using real-world uh, uh, real examples to help explain to people what they were moving into. Well, pardon me for saying this, but part of that is that people are always telling women who they're supposed to be. Mm. And I grew up, you know... I was supposed to be this, and I was supposed to behave this way, and I was supposed to be that, and I was supposed to behave that way. And uh, I had this, this part-time job at the, at the local rectory, and, uh, and one of the grand pillars of the church brought in the collection box, and when he found out where I was from, he found out where I lived, he wouldn't let go of it because... I was from that place, so I was that person. Um, then I was, uh, um, then I was supposed to, I was supposed to just make do with whatever I could scrounge and, uh, and hope that things got better. And, uh, and it seemed to me that everyone was telling me who I was supposed to be. And without even finding out who I was, in fact, they didn't even really seem interested in who I was uh, or who I am. And, uh, and now, uh, you know, as a, as a woman in her 60s, I face it again. Hmm. You know, an old lady isn't supposed to do this. An old lady isn't supposed to wear a really loud dress. Can you hear me over the dress? <laughs> an old lady isn't supposed to go dancing till 4 a.m. in a club in the West End. An old lady isn't supposed to swear like a sailor. You know, an old lady isn't supposed to be energetic. An old lady who's a cancer patient isn't supposed to smile. Well, I'm not smiling now because actually I, I need to go to the dentist, but... Um, For free. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid I actually pay for dentistry okay. because I am such a a dentist phobe that they have to they have to tranquilize me just to get me near the office. Then I'll go in without fighting. But that's besides the point. What minute, What was the question? Oh yes, identity. Everyone's always telling you who you are. Who's your? What's your credit rating? That's you. Where do you live? That's you. What do you do? That's you. So then people use VR and fantasy role-playing to have the, at least the, the simulation of agency over identity. Well, we used to call it playing spaceman or yeah. Mars or cowboys and Native Americans. But uh, uh, we've always had VR. You know, VR isn't that much of a stretch. Now we can just see it better. Yeah, well, you used to call, um, you know, writing VR. I mean, writing was the poor, the poor kids' VR. You got to create worlds that other people went in. You didn't need all the, you didn't need Intel or a grant to do it. No, but uh, no one will pay you for it afterwards either. Mm. Not unless you get uh, Intel or a grant or a contract. <laughs> so, um... you've also you talked a lot about nine eleven. Mm-hmm. And you know, I've thought about that a lot too, particularly after hearing you talk about it. The the sense that 
you know, on September 10th, the world... That was my birthday, by the way. <sighs> I hate Bin Laden. I hate him so much. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But, but, had a flashback. Yeah, but we reached this point of almost maximum openness on September 10th. And then on September 11th, like things started to close down. Not just security, but uh, uh, we started to uh, uh, embrace the surveillance state and surveillance capitalism. Well, yeah, I know I don't really want to be looked at, but if they're coming with a bomb, if they're coming with a this, it's, it's better to be safe than sorry. Yeah, it's a, it's a trip taking a, a plane, plane flight these days, you want to see a, a, you know, a TSA person break up when she goes to pat you down, or he goes to pat you down, say, do what you got to do, but don't get attached, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 9-11 is a case of, the, of yeah. the technology coming and biting us back on the ass, right? Yeah, yeah, and actually what 9-11 is, is uh, complacency biting us in the ass. Um, when I lived in the US, I wasn't very aware of what was going on in the rest of the world. And it's hard for me to explain how big the US is. And most people who live in other countries, particularly you know countries the size of the UK, don't know how big the US is. But even people who live in America, they don't know how big the US is. Because, you know, if you, if you go from Washington, D.C. to California, you might as well go from one country to another because the country is so big, it is, you know, sections of it are pretty much divorced from each other, practically. And, uh, but also, it's, it's on its own North American continent. It's off there by itself. Most Americans, most people who live in the U.S. do not have passports or at least they didn't before 9-11. I think now if they want to go down to Tijuana or up to Toronto, they have to have passports. But I didn't have a passport until I was like 36 years old. And, uh, and most people get along without them. Uh, they'll never leave the North American continent. They'll never leave the United States. They don't know what it's like. And it's hard for me to... You know, so I, I went back to Kansas recently. I went back to the University of Kansas to teach uh, some writing workshops for two weeks. And, um, and I thought about trying to explain to people that, you know, your problem is that you all drive separate cars. If there was, you know, if there was more public transportation, you might have more awareness of, of just the presence of other people. But most of America does not have public transportation. They do not travel together. And as I was on my way here in a car, um, I, I saw this, 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 I don't know what it was, but it was advertising this project that they'd had with, uh, with artists to devise the best kind of self-driving car. And it showed you know, all the little cars on the highway or on the road, um, they w were nowhere near as close as they should have been in London, you know, if it, to be a real picture. But I was thinking, you, we don't need self-driving cars. We need more public transportation to be more aware of people around us, to, be, to feel more like we're, we're in this with other people, not to be isolated. And um, I liked the idea of, you know, multiplayer games because, because then people are alone, but they're not. And this was good for, like, people with agoraphobia or people with social anxiety. It actually did help them a great deal. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not an anti-digital person by any means. And I'd read this book, and I can't remember... <laughs> can't remember the name or the name of the author, but she was a, like a, a dame or a lady. And it was all about how bad the internet is for us. And so I wrote her a letter saying, you know, I, I understand a lot of your points and I see a lot of your points, but the internet for me has, met, has meant that I don't have to sit alone in my house, dying of cancer all by myself with nobody caring about me. 
And it's meant that my husband doesn't have to bear the whole burden alone. And I'm not dying of cancer, I'm living with it. But um, the support that I got when I came out about cancer, yes, cancer patients come out. There are a lot of people who don't talk about it for reasons of their own. But um, I could be out about it. And I, once I did, I, got, I heard from all kinds of people you know, just want to send me a good word, you know, say, say something good to me, say, yeah, good for you. What was the question? <laughs> we were actually talking about 9-11, and then... Oh, the, yeah, and the, and the oh, yeah rise, that was terrible, 9-11, you know, awful. The, well, yeah, I mean, it was terrible, but it was also, no, it felt like a, an affront to the cyberpunk ethos. You know, that here we were talking about the power of the, on, on the edges, and it's gonna, you know, technology's gonna decentralize everything, and then 9-11 happens, and everyone says to me, yeah, that's what you get with decentralized power, you know, so shut up, kid. Uh, no, I, that's what you get with complacency. Right. With, um, with being unaware that there are people who hate you, and they don't hate you because they're evil. Okay, maybe they are evil. But the thing is, unlike co in comics or movies based on comics, nobody thinks they're the bad guy. Nobody. The Taliban don't think they're the bad guy. They don't want to watch the world burn. They want to save the world from infidels or something, I don't know. Um, people who, who, you know, oppress other people don't see themselves as the bad guy. Nobody thinks they're the bad guy. And the people who, you know, flew the planes into the towers and, and into the Pentagon, they didn't see themselves as the bad guys. They, if there's an afterlife, they probably still don't. And the, the result, at least for us, I think for you to you here as well, the result of, of uh, terror is increased surveillance and surveillance not just uh, uh, not just by security, not just even by uh, uh, surveillance capitalism, but surveillance as culture. You know whether you know Big Brother became a television show. Uh, it's it's reality yeah, TV. Yeah, I, I, I always wondered what George Orwell would say if he found out that Big Brother was a game show, <laughs> and it went from Big Brother is watching you to Big Brother is you watching, because in fact. You only watched like, what, a dozen people. A dozen people are watched by everybody in the world, you know. And every country has a big brother. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely detest big brother. That, I, re, I detest reality shows anyway because they put writers out of work. Well, but they, they, they also c capitalize on cruelty. They're set up like Stanley Milgram experiments. You know, let's put nine aspiring models in an apartment together and let only one be the top model and see, let them go at each other. Or, you know, or worse, or let's, they had a show in the U.S. called um, something like Joe Millionaire, and it was these 10 women competing to get the affections of the one guy and to do whatever they can oh, to get him me. to... And then they find out at the end that he's, after he proposes to the one, that he's not a millionaire, but he's an auto mechanic. And it was crazy. Well, it serves all you gold diggers right. <laughs> no, it's, it, it not only uh, it, it bullies, but it plays upon people's worst um, tendencies. I mean, everyone has, you know, has less than honorable tendencies, and uh, and you can live so that you continually indulge those, or you can live to, you know, with the better angels of your nature, and uh, that's another thing that I really hate about reality TV because it's a culture of, of bullying, you know, and uh, and the talent shows, you know, it's, it's, get somebody on the stage to be booed off. Well, in America, I mean, kids think of American Idol as democracy. So God when you have me. that posing as democracy and reality TV posing as politics... And now we have Trump as yeah. president. Yeah. It's crossed yeah, over. That's how, that's how that happened. Oh, I warned you. Yeah, you... Yeah, but my books didn't sell, so... <laughs> <laughs> didn't sell enough, anyway. Um, but you did warn. You warned yeah. about the crossover, basically, when the when the the virtual spectacle crosses over into the real world and and replaces it. Still, I 
I think we could fix that. That's what know? I was going to ask. I really, how? I, oh, you'd ask me that. You know. <laughs> well, how? How can we fix that? Um, in America, in the U.S., there has always been the, the idea of, you know, the rugged individualist, the one person who's going to come along with an idea and fix everything. And in fact, everything that has ever been accomplished, civilization was not accomplished by one man who told everyone where to build things or one woman telling everyone to clean up after themselves. It was accomplished by whole groups of people who came to a consensus about the best way to live under the circumstances. And, you know, it's like echoing Team Human. The, the idea of being together, and I'm, I'm for anything that fosters the awareness that there are other people in the world, and, uh, and you know, it's like the, the Ten dollar, ten ten pound, uh, half calf macchiato with a, with caramel and two shots is is you know this is trash next to the idea of helping someone get on their feet, and there are crowdsourcing things like Kickstarter and GoFundMe that have have done wonderful things. They've they've helped people with uh, with businesses. They've helped people with bad medical bills, which everybody in the United States has, whether they have insurance or not. And, you know, it's like, this is, these are the sorts of things that, that are active now. And I, I, you know, I want to talk more, I want us to talk more about the possibilities of crowdsourcing all kinds of things. Crowdsourcing education. Um, when uh, when my son was uh, was in elementary school, they uh, they wanted me to give him Ritalin, mm. so I got the prescription, took it myself. But um, Ritalin doesn't cure childhood. Nothing cures childhood. They grow up, you know. So why don't we teach them like their children, you know? Teach them like in sound bites and then, you know, sort of keep them going all day long rather than drugging all of them so that they'll sit still and shut up. No, oh, it's because we live in an attention economy, so you give them attention drugs. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, before, before we let you go, I want to um, find out, can you tell us about the sushi novel? The sushi novel. That you're working on right as we speak. Yeah, the sushi novel. Um, in 2013, I won a Hugo Award for a novelette called Girl Thing Who Went Out for Sushi. And I had just put that title on it, hoping that the editor would come up with something better, but he didn't. But it was a memorable title, and, and, it, it, and the story won the Hugo, and it was about people living in outer space. And I thought, you know, terraforming is really expensive and time-consuming. What if we just put people in habitats in orbits around planets, and adapt people to live weightlessly. You can adapt the human body faster than you can terraform Titan. So, um, and you can get the characteristics passed on with epigenetics. So, um, and then I thought, what would be the ideal form for life in outer space where you'd live weightlessly, but occasionally when you traveled, you'd have to you'd have to withstand a lot of acceleration. And I thought, undersea life, octopuses are made to settle outer space. So I did a little hand-waving with nanotechnology, as we do, and, uh, and I had people who decide to become, to take the form of octopuses. And, uh, and some take the form of, um, of uh, what are they called? Herm Herm Hermit crabs? No. No. The, um, Thank you, darling. What are they? Chambered nautiluses. Mm. These are lawyers and teachers because they can inscribe information on the inside of their shells and then chamber it off. And you know, and you know, it's like they got the same thing as, as octopuses. And uh, and I, I threw in a, a little more sea life to to make it diverse. And um, and so, as it turns out, race relations have to do with um, bipeds versus sushi. And uh, so I'm writing a novel set 
um, about 150 years after the the occurrence of uh, the events of um, Girl Thing Who Went Out for Sushi, in which a um, a nurse who has been abducted by aliens and was dropped off somewhere. It's now been sent back 700 years later. And this is a black inner city nurse who worked in a, you know, an under, underfunded hospital in Schenectady. And she wakes up and she finds herself, and even if you are biped, you don't look like, you don't look like this magnificent example that you see before you. Under gravity, your, your face grows out and down. Without gravity, your face just grows out. And you'll be long, and, and I thought, you know, it's like, make the, make the bones bendable, you know? It's like, don't have them breaking all the time. And so um, um, when she wakes up, she sees pumpkin-headed linguine people and giant monster octopuses. But then she eventually, she is eventually integrated into the society and uh, she's in a habitat orbiting Neptune, which is, you know, the last, the last place everybody who can't fit in anywhere else goes. And, um, and she thinks to herself, I knew who I was in 2010, Schenectady, New York. Who am I now? And the more I thought about, and, and I thought about using a black character, because I use a lot of a lot of black and Asian and, and Indian characters in my in my work, uh, as well as you know, it's like I uh, I've always had uh, androgynous. I call them androgynous people. They're, now they're they're called non-binary, and um, um, I've always had those people as well in my work, and uh, so I I liked the idea of of thinking about race through this woman's eyes. And thinking about the future, and you know, it's like she's she has no memory uh, of her abduction or the time that she spent in space. Her memory's been wiped. All she remembers is she was walking to her car, and suddenly she wakes up like this. And uh, uh, it's an excuse for me to insert, you know, present day uh, commentary onto the future, and you know, and talk about things. And uh, um, she decides that she wants to go back to Earth. And uh, so they have a little, little, everybody gets in the spaceship for a road trip, you know. And uh, by the time they, they get to Earth, which takes a while, oh, and lifespans are really stretched out in outer space, in my outer space. You can live 500 years or more. And uh, by the time she gets there, she, she knows that she doesn't belong there. But she doesn't belong in a habitat either. So everybody decides to uh, to take a bigger road trip to look look for whoever sent her back. I gave away the ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, now anyone who just heard that now has to buy it. You're obligated now. It's IP. But when does that come out? When I sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to sell it. Um, and uh, um, I'm, uh, let's see, I'm almost through the first draft. And I, I've had a lot of interruptions. Well, um, you had uh, Battle Angel Alita, you're doing the novelization. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I did the novelization for Alita Battle Angel. And I also did the prequel novel called Iron City. And then next February, there's going to be a novel about Harley Quinn out uh, called Harley Quinn Mad Love that I wrote in collaboration with Paul Dini. And I'm a busy girl. You are. But for a long time, I was taking care of my mother, and I couldn't do anything but short fiction because she she was a diva. And now, well, the cancer's yeah. just in the background. Yeah, no, and you just it, work, work, work. For the, well, for the first time in my life, um, I don't have a, a child to raise. I don't have an elderly parent to take care of. I don't have an outside job to work. So I got cancer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can't win, can you? But at least right now you don't have chemo to go to. No, well, so. no. It, but that was kind of fun, actually, because my chemo was 10% alcohol, and I'm a cheap drunk. <laughs> Every three weeks, I'd go get smashed at the McMillan Center. <laughs> you make I know, I know. It sounds fun. like fun. <laughs> it sounds like fun. Well, thank you, Pat Cadigan, for being on Team Human. 
please, uh, uh, you go now, but come back on stage for our little menage a trois at the end of the show. That'll be cool. You, you can all find out more about Pat Cadigan's books and writing at patcadigan.wordpress.com. Buy and read her books right now. Or are not. <laughs>